I am going to remind you of some of the requirements and um, have it on this video. There's one thing I will say that is not right now on the syllabus that I will put onto the syllabus, but I need to show you why um, I'm starting to get concerned. Um, let's see, there are quite a few assignments not in, not turned in, right? So under classwork, um out of fifth out of there are eight students who have not gotten post number one in um hafsa uh here here are all the nizali uh fayaza oh i think parman dropped so that's fine rahima roshani uh, Sadia, Taslima, okay? You need to get it in. It's, it's two weeks late now, I think. It's approaching two weeks late. And that's, once it gets to two weeks late, the grades are going to start going down. Um, because last time I was too lenient and, um, and it just got completely out of hand. So if you have a reason for why it's late and you could have a reason, you entered the class late, right? If you came to, if you started the class a week late, you can hand this in, you know, uh, more than two weeks, but you may really need to hand it in within a few days. Post number two. Um, has nine people that haven't handed it in yet. So I assume you know who you are. It's a lot of the same people or, um, well, okay. It looks like, all right. So it looks like there's just three, four, um, some of them, oh no, five, six, seven, there's a number. <laughs> All right, so some of you didn't do the whole assignment. And so then I said, I won't grade it, just finish it up. So every assignment um, involves two classes. And for every day, except the first day, you have a reading and you, you write down what you wanna talk about in the reading, when we get to class, then that's three points, or I have something specific on the announcement. The second one is three things you learned from somebody else during the class or while listening to the YouTube. The third one is your final takeaway. Do you think you're going to use this in your final paper? Why or why not? You need to do that twice. So I'm just getting a lot of students who are not doing what I asked. So uh, I don't like being authoritarian, but I, I'm going to say it once more. It's in the syllabus. It's on the early instructions for the assignments. But, you know, I don't think I should have to say it every single time. It, that's it, you do it every time. Okay, then for the third one, if you have serious obstacles during the semester, you put all these down and then um, I will add, you know, I will assess them and um, consider, right, how many weeks late and all that. So, you also should put it in your post because again, I can't remember all this stuff. Um, so by the end of the semester, I can look at each student and see all the obstacles they had, which is fine. Okay, Mahira. Yeah, ma'am, if I don't have any obstacles, do I have to do that? No, just get things in. 
if you don't have any obstacles and you don't hand anything late thank goodness <laughs> i need more i mean you know it's not students fault um so here we are this was last this was last week's assignment correct and it's supposed to be in by now and there's there's a lot of them missing let's put it that way so you really need to do this um I'm going to put on the syllabus that if it's once it gets to be more than one week late, if there's no obstacles and it's two weeks late, the grade goes down, right? And if it's more than that, the grade goes down more. Um, I would like to make it from an A to a C and a B to a D because I just want you to do it. Just do it. <laughs> um, so now, at least when you look at this, you know why I, I, you know, have to put a whole lot more threats in place because it's just not happening. So that's that. I hope that's clear. Um, let's see. So that that's what I really want to say at the moment. And then I want to get to this, the readings for today, but let me go and stop. Just any questions on that? Uh, so I, you know, I do want you to come to office hours and talk to me um, rather than go on a discussion board and complain. Please don't do that. That I don't know how many students do that, but for your sake, it's it's really not the thing to do because you should always, you know, speak out if you have a question in any aspect of your life. Uh, don't be passive aggressive, you know. Don't talk behind people's backs uh, as if I were your boss, right? So if you have a question and you don't want to ask your boss, I think it's much better that you would than if you get rumors and you know all this back, back, you know, behind the behind the scenes stuff. So that it's right about this time in the semester that that tends to start, I've been told. <laughs> so I would just please don't do that. Um, Pooja would probably, if you do, if you really don't want to come to me or the office hours aren't convenient, Pooja has had the, one of my classes before, so she understands. So I would, you can go to her. Is that okay, Pooja? Because she will, she will tell you correct information. <laughs> I mean, I have students telling other students things that I don't know where they get these things. So let's just cut that off, nip that in the bud right away. Um, all right. So our, the process of the class last week, we did the importance of education and the Apollo archetype. Um, there were some students I mean, one student said she had a friend and the friend paints and sings, but that's not the Apollo archetype, right? Apollo is the God of music, but it's very ordered music and it's not singing. It's playing on a loop because it's cerebral, right? Um, so Aphrodite would be the one with dance and painting. And of course, you don't know that because you haven't read all of them. But the one reason that I showed that video clip of the woman who started the big business, she, she really seems to me like she has that science kind of mind, that logical kind of mind. So it was science that started it, but she uses that same kind of logical reasoning, calculating, by setting up her business, by running her business. Um, she's very matter of fact. 
Uh, she doesn't play politics. I thought that was interesting. Another thing about her is that when the interviewer said, well, don't you think some people are going to misinterpret the information um, about the, their, their genes? And she said, well, I just think people should have access to information. She just didn't, didn't even want to bring up a political question where there ought to be regulations or something. She's just completely away from that. And she just said, you should give people facts and they can decide what to do with the facts. And that, that's a typical Apollonian sort of response is that you don't think about the impact of this wonderful science or technology how it's going to play out. And um, I wrote a book about a guy who, is, who was um, a neuroscientist and he did all the research that developed, uh, led to the development of opioids and all these drugs. And he literally, he says in his book, and he wrote it in 2003, that he he thought in 20 years, we will have changed the human playing field. Like humanity will be substantially different in relation to um, pain, depression, addiction, and violence. He was gonna cure, <laughs> he was gonna cure humanity of these, these problems within 20 years. Well, my goodness, right? That is not what happened. So you can't just do research, come up with a drug that if it's used correctly, will do a lot of good in the world and just say, well, people should find out, you know, um, people should know, people will know you can trust them or, um, well, as long as it's a pres prescription, right? But there's no concern about how do you make sure the doctors aren't overprescribing? How do you make sure they don't oh, deliberately overprescribe so they'll get more more patients and make more money? How do you know if the politicians will prevent it from be from becoming a recreational drug in small doses? if you know it's so addicting. He was just oblivious to that. And so I think he represented that kind of Apollonian archetype where science and information will save us. And people just need to know all this information and to be given these products. And then she said, we do need to educate the public. So somebody has to educate the public. Um, but who's that going to be? <laughs> anyway, I, I want you to try and be able to get a sense that there are, there is a distinction between these goddesses, even though any one person's life is a combination. Um, but the difference between Artemis, Apollo, and, um, uh, Athena, and we're going to do Athena next time. They're all independent women. They're all focused. They're all driven. Uh, but Artemis is the woods woman, right? She's the nature lover, and she will get involved in a in a movement, and she'll organize and she'll do that stuff. But because she loves nature, right? Um, the Apollonian woman just loves science and she wants to, her motive in the public would be just to spread the knowledge around. That's what she would want to do and to educate women, right? And to provide every opportunity. And then Athena is the one that worries about justice and the distribution of these these products or um, how to 
how to make environmental laws, right? Or how to make laws to regulate pharmaceuticals or the 23andMe product. So that's a, those are different orientations. Um, but for now, for today, we're still working on the Apollo archetype as just focused on women getting educated. And um, a lot of you, of course, we're all on board with that. So the reading for today, Dancing in the Mosque, was about a woman who grew up in Afghanistan. And I would be curious in your breakout groups, the difference between when I taught this last summer and when I'm teaching it now is that, of course, Afghanistan has completely changed. So this story is about when the Taliban first took over and the key there, what her grandmother wanted her to do at age 13 was to educate the young girls because she didn't want them to end up like the grandmother, illiterate with nothing. So, um, and then there's, you know, stories, you, you read the story. So I wanted you to, to just get into breakout groups and just talk about your reaction to the reading. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't have any other agenda. I don't usually, I'm more of a conceptual thinker. And so I don't usually assign not, you know, novels or stories, but it's so relevant to this main issue of learning to read education. And it's also from the point of view of a woman in the Mideast. So that's why I started reading these books and assigning them. Um, so I don't know how long the breakout groups will take. They might take the whole time and they might not, but just come on back in because we have other things to do today. So whenever you're done, but just go ahead and have a talk about if you grew up in a country that was similar. Yeah, okay, okay. Sadia, I, I get it. Um, so if you grew up in a country where the situation was similar and what you did and um, what you see moving forward, do you think your country is going to change a lot by the time you're my age, right? Just whatever thoughts you have, it would be nice to just get into a conversation about it. All right, and I will take attendance while you're talking. Um, I'll put you into two groups and you can let me know afterwards if the groups are too big or too small. Too big, I guess would be it. Okay. Just Can you all get in? Okay. Professor? Yes. Hello, Professor. 
So we were from the group one and we we discussed, you know, like the story uh, uh, yes. of the. Oh, you. So you, can, you can continue. No, no, no. I just said, is everyone back? Oh, well, I was just getting started. Um, they'll be back momentarily, I guess. Okay. So, Professor, we start, you know, we compare the time period between, you know, like uh, the present time and the uh, period of 1996 around and how the women were, I mean, the situation of women at that time and, you know, this time and, you know, the condition, uh, you know, before that, I mean, before that, women were not much educated. They couldn't um, defend their voice when Taliban attacks and seized all the schools and colleges and they were not able to get education in a proper way in that time. And if we compare that time with the time now, so women are very strong, educated, and they know how, uh, they know now they what they can do. And women are very empowered, um, you know, brave and they fight for their rights, voice and freedoms, you know, that sort of conversation happened between, you know, we listen the story uh, by one of our Afghan uh, friends and then I, I also delivered some of the part that I knew from the story and this is how we compare the story from that time and to this time. Good. Yes, Prophet. Um, so there is, I don't know, here's, here's my thought that the women in the city or the women who are educated um, might be able to maintain some rights. So I don't know what you think, but the Taliban might know that it's politically unwise to go back to oppressing women in Kabul or women who have platforms, right? But what about the rural women? And how are they gonna get treated? Maybe without even the Taliban leadership knowing what's going on. Um, so I worry that the, the rural women will start, will suffer. Um, the same with um, in, a child marriage in Bangladesh when COVID hit, uh, there's a lot of things getting worse. But um, Marzia, what do you think? Uh, professor, I want to talk about your question about women in rural area. The problem is that these extremist groups do not allow the press to cover the situation. The right. situation of situation of women in rural area is is unimaginable you know right now in kabul which is like international press cover is still they beat um, praise they do not allow journalists to cover the women's protests and i have heard one of the one women who was worked with the previous government as a police officer they killed him brutally in, in front of his family, her family. Why? Because he was a police officer. This was her, her crime. So this is the problem that we even cannot hear their voice. The world even keep them, uh, like the world, the worlds do not want to see them. So this is like disaster. So have they kicked out all the journalists? they have beaten them so badly that even they couldn't walk and oh. still some are in prison some who came out uh, they are not good mentally and also physically they can walk some of them even cannot talk maybe you have heard in the news yeah so just about nobody can go on to social media and tell somebody outside of Afghanistan what's going on. Will they get in trouble? Yeah, exactly. 
This is the problem. Yep. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't look good. Um, anyway, that was the, that was my main theme there was just about the importance of education. And then I also assigned the same thing with a few pages from Frederick Douglass because I just wanted to, I wanted to make the point that that too was his salvation. He, um, he went to uh, the home of Sophie, Sophie and she started educating him, right? Because she had a son the same age. And so she started teaching him how to read and um, that her husband said, you know, don't do that. Because if you teach those people how to read, they, they'll be uppity, right? They won't accept slavery anymore. Um, and that was it. When he overheard her husband tell her, tell her that, he was determined to learn how to read. So his slave owners always gave him enough to eat. This was Baltimore and so Sophie, the wife, had never had a slave before. She married into a slaveholding family. So she, they always gave him enough to eat. So he would go outside to play on his off hours and he would give bread to some of the poor white boys in exchange for learning to read. And that was his ticket, right? And then in other times when he was in other places, he started little schools on Sunday on their day off. Everything was about learning to read. And that was what got him out. So the reason why I picked this was, you know, we're about the importance of education. Um, oh yeah, Malala Yosef. Um, well, going through the story, yeah, Malala also, I actually read her book because some of my students recommended that. Um, yeah, so I somehow it didn't, I didn't find an excerpt though, and I really should go back and, and look at that excerpt. She, Malala, <laughs> when I was reading it, it's just very immediate. She's not a theoretical thinker. She's just really, this happened and this happened and my brother's always fighting with me. <laughs> so when I read it, it just, just sort of uh, flew by. But that is another book about that. And obviously she um, is a big figure in efforts to get women educated. Um, but I, the other thing is that I wanted to uh, deal with the issue of, the big issue in this class and every class is that human beings have their humanity by nature. And the goal of life is to completely engage, you know, activate all of your human capacities. And that's a universal value. It's not moral relativism. So in the, as the globalization occurs, people are, there's a lot of people who settle for moral relativism, right? oh, well, you do it this way and we do it this way. And it's just relative. It's people get adjusted to their circumstances and they get comfortable with it. And then they think everybody else is wrong. That's how they become intolerant. So if we just tolerate each other, everything will be wonderful because nobody has the truth. Well, a different way of looking at that, there's many many people who get conditioned into one thing and they do think it's the absolute truth and they use it to oppress 
or kill or demonize somebody else, right? There's us and them. And the, the classical virtues, as Aristotle defines them, they have been used, right? To justify colonialism. So you have to be very careful how you articulate what it is that is universal and what it is that's not. Um, and so I wanted to go through just some of the themes in Frederick Douglass's book. Well, let me do the, the outline of the excerpt here. Dancing in the Mosque, uh, Taliban shut down women's rights. Her mother wanted more for her grandmother, I think. Um, and it was how the Taliban got so much money from selling opium. Um, here's another point to make is that people were saying that God caused this because God is angry at us. And I think there are places all over the world, I'm sure, where people are saying it's because women are getting uppity and they want rights that God is, you know, letting the Taliban come back. Um, so, okay, so then this, the storyline was that she started teaching in the mosque tent and then it got shut down. And then in the bathhouse, the girls were back to their old petty concerns, but she convinced them to um, care about their education. Then the Taliban closed the bathhouse and it just goes right back. So that's another issue you wanna worry about. If women who at one point were really interested in getting educated are gonna fall back and they're not gonna care anymore. Um, then, uh, yeah, not all the Taliban are bad. So this young man wasn't really on board with it, but that's an old theme in power situations is that somebody ends up having to work for the Taliban or some group they don't really like. They don't really go along, but they have to, or they'll get killed or they won't be able to feed their families. Um, so that was, this is just sort of a description of what went on. Then she started this reading group in her friend's house and she started writing stories. Then it got published and her name got on it. And that was big trouble. Um, and then she has her story, her life story goes on and on. And eventually she gets married, she publishes things and um, her husband divorces her. And she has to, yeah, Mahira, I'll, I'll call on you in a sec. Her husband divorces her and wants to get with a younger woman and doesn't like being associated with this uppity woman who's in the public eye. And so then she has to decide whether to stay and be the rejected first wife and live there or to, to leave her son behind and leave. And so she's writing these letters to her son because um, it was a terrible choice, right? So it was a terrible situation that her husband put her in. And it's an easy thing to do. You can really control people's behavior by threatening their children or taking their children away or whatever. Mahira, did you want to say something? No, I just wanted to know that what happened in the last, that she, did she got what she wanted, like teaching, teaching the girls, then did, she, did they do something? Oh, I can't, let's see. She eventually got out. How was it? I think the Taliban, you know, I can't remember the storyline. Um, I think the Taliban got overthrown, right? And this new regime came in and she, she managed to get herself out. Um, 
I cannot remember. I'm sorry, Mahira. I should I should remember. I read the book, um, but it, it, the book is there, so you can um, check it out. Um, Mom, so, Professor, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I guess uh, like Mahira says that she get her dream. Uh, I just want to say that uh, in 2000, like Taliban's regime was for six years from 1996 to 2001. And after 2001, the situation has changed and women on that time could find the uh, facilities and the opportunities to get education. So she she studied, I think, her bachelor in Persian literature in uh, um Aaron and after that she has a um, master degree also in Persian literature and also she has her PhD from one of US schools I think in literature and uh, she was in Afghanistan and she left after collapse of the country and yeah I think she got but this book has uh, this book talks that which difficulties and which uh, obstacles she faced to take to take to reach the situation and well, she got like, married and she went back to Afghanistan right and her husband yeah. told her that he was fine with her being an educated woman right yes they they lived 14 years together but there were some problems between she wanted to go to us and follow her uh, phd but her son was maybe baby and her husband said no because she, there is a baby you cannot leave so she she left the baby and then he divorced her and married to someone else and she wrote this book when she was far away of her son and this later and uh, uh, explained her life story, the difficulties, and finally she got her her son as well, and now they live together. Oh, really? I didn't realize she got her son back. That's nice. No, now now they live together. She is with her mom. He is with her mom. He he got out of Afghanistan too. The son. Yeah, they have lived after collapse of the country. Okay, all right. Um, oh, just recently, you mean? Yes, recently, after 15th of August. I mean, they were there after the collapse of the country, but they were, they were not able to continue acti their activities. So they were completely in prison. Everyone is in prison in their home. So it was unacceptable to her and she left with her son and, and with her family. So right, right now, now, right now I have no idea in which country she is, maybe US or I don't know. But she's with her son. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's great. I yeah, that's good. Okay, um, all right. That's good news. Um, I got to keep up with that. Then um, the next one, I was going to, oh yeah, Douglas. So this one is about um, why slavery is completely unnatural. So when we did Mary Wollstonecraft, their argument was that sexism is unnatural, right? That John Stuart Mill argued that women should be treated as equals and he gave all these reasons. So if you remember, we went over that whole outline. And this is very similar. I just wanted to show you a lot of the arguments are the same. And so this would be an argument for why discrimination based on religion is unnatural, right? Because there's this other level of human flourishing that's more important that every society either tries to promote flourishing or it inhibits it but you can evaluate societies as better or worse based on um, whether they promote flourishing and it's true that people can get conditioned to accept it but 
it's still unnatural. And every time a little girl is born or somebody in the minority race or religion is born, they figure out as a kid that they're not being treated fairly, right? That the other, the other kids, just because of their skin or their gender or whatever, are not naturally better. And so the truth is always under the surface, underneath the social conditioning. And societies really need to work on structuring themselves so that they do promote flourishing. That's what, and the UN calls them out, right? The UN evaluates every country every year, I think, to see if the people who have power are using it to promote the well being of the people in their societies. So there can be a universal standard. Um, the actual standard of living varies because each ruler only has so many resources and they have so many people. So the act, you know, it's not the case that if not, if every, not everybody has a car that therefore the rulers are corrupt, right? That's common sense. If people have what they need based on what's available. Um, Slavery corrupts everything. And so this also, I wanna get back to the goddesses, right? Slavery corrupts Demeter, the mother-child relationship. It, marriage has to do with Hera. Slavery corrupts every marriage relationship. Um, sl slavery, the importance of childhood habituation, of having kids growing up, taking pleasure in doing things that enable them to flourish. So slavery prevents children from flourishing every step of the way as they're growing up. It has a corrupting influence on the development, the formation of their character. Um, there are what's called the seven deadly sins, which I think every major religion has these. Um, the Institutions like slavery allow for sexual exploitation, greed. People are allowed to make money off of other people's labor. Pride, people feel like they're more virtuous than they are um, be because there's unjust social position. Um, envy, people start um, envying each other because they don't think the other person has what's appropriate. Uh, wrath, if slavery allows people to get way too angry, you know, they can be angry at a slave, that's a tool of oppression. Sloth, people with money can be lazy and the people who have to work have no nothing. Um, the gluttony, so, um, so education is a, a corrupting influence if it's not distributed justly, but this was the story of Frederick Douglass and he, um, his, he, okay, so he learned how to read and he read this one book, The Columbian Orator, and they're having a dialogue about whether slavery should be abolished. And he just memorized that book because that was the argument that went on in his head all the time. And um, so he kept developing that argument over time, but it just took this one book to sort of plant the seed and legitimize the kinds of argument that were going on in his head. So, but he had to know how to read to be able to take in that book and internalize that. Uh, book. All right, let's see. To make a contented slave. All right. And then he just, his story um, talks about the different ways that slaveholders abuse their power. And you can evaluate them as better or worse. This is, there are universal standards of justice and injustice. 
um, religion, oftentimes religion, just like with the Taliban, they use religion to justify their oppression. Um, so the arguments in favor of it are bogus. Somebody has to speak out. Um, okay, so this is this is just comparing to that uh, outline we had last time on Wollstonecraft. It's the same kind of pattern, and I think some of some of our students, some AUW students from um, Afghanistan, are oppressed in two ways. They're partly because they belong to a minority sect. So that's the same illegitimate justification for oppression. You could just go through all the whole list all over again and just say, because, I think it starts with an H. They're just a certain minority. So, so we can legitimately criticize the way uh, governments work. It's not just your opinion. And it's not just because you want more power, right? You can just step away and say, it's wrong because women are capable of this and they're being denied the ability to develop their capabilities. So that's the main, um, that's sort of the structure through which to evaluate these different goddesses. Each one has a certain passion. Each one needs to be allowed to live out that passion because it's a part of her humanity. And each one of those gets so crippled by patriarchy. So that's um, sort of the uh, foundation for where we're going as well as where we've been in the class. It just gives you a pattern, right? So we've done Artemis and we've done um, Apollo and now we're gonna do Athena next time. But Demeter, so you can see how all the areas of life, all the aspects of life, there is a goddess that sort of fits, the archetype fits, those times in a person's life when those particular energies really are actively being engaged and tapped into. Um, so that's that was what I wanted to get at today, it's the importance of reading and then the, the importance of the overall model of flourishing and that it's a legitimate way to evaluate societies as better or worse. Um, are there any questions about that? Because I'm gonna spend the rest of the time going over the paper assignment so that everybody's on board. The paper's due in about two weeks, two weeks and a couple days. And I wanna make sure, I mean, I used to not talk about it in class because I said, oh, it's right on the syllabus. <laughs> but that doesn't go over. I'm going to take time to do, to go over it in class and to take questions so people aren't anxious or nervous or whatever about it. But are there any questions about the material for the day? Okay. No, okay, so here we are. Let's go to, um, this is for next time, Athena. So you read about her and you bring uh, examples. So here's the, here is the syllabus. Let's go over the course syllabus again. I think some of you came late into the class. And, and I think it's just a good reminder for where we've been and where we're going. So the class has three parts. It, it looks at the goddesses and how they represent parts of life. Then when men took over, they got crippled under patriarchy, 
how so many aspects of life get wounded. We also discuss the impact of race, class, ethnicity, and then that's what I was talking about today, right? Post-colonialism, environmental degradation. So we talked about the effect of environmental degradation, especially on women, when we we're talking about ecofeminism. Uh, Post-colonialism, uh, we're gonna read some, some th other things very specifically related to that. Uh, but I did mention that these virtues have been used as a bludgeon to really justify colonialism, right? Because we're superior because we have higher intellectual capacity or whatever. So, um, so you can take that same framework and just say the mistake was that Western white men thought only they could exercise them. So we don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater. We can take those same capacities and say, everyone is capable. So then you expose the prejudice. Um, all right, and we'll do more with, with colonialism and post-colonialism. Um, globalization, we can talk about that actually when we do Athena, and then uh, the week after this, we're gonna talk more about this sort of stuff because it's related to justice issues, the kind of issues that Athena would be concerned about. Um, the reason I do wanna say that I think most women's issues classes will probably focus on women's rights and what's going on in the political arena and laws and institutions. But I, I think that it marginalizes other women, right? There are women who just wanna take care of kids. They don't wanna be out in the public eye making laws or fighting for this and that, right? There are women who really just want to get engaged in the arts and they want to use that engagement to, to just use that passion to maybe start a nonprofit where other girls can get involved with the arts. I mean, there's just many dimensions to life. And so women will start at a different starting point. And the Athena types will help them move from their own passion to some kind of organizational structure that enables other people, other women to get involved. But you have to, each woman has to start where she is most passionate and then move out into the public eye. Or a woman whose favorite place is out there in the public has to go into the private sector, go into the art studios and whatever, and try to link, try to make uh, a woman's art, try to sell it, right? Try to get engaged in the business part of the job, of that passion. So, um, all right. Uh, students bring examples, right? So this is what we've been doing. Now, the papers, right? Students write one paper on which goddess they identify with most. That's your second paper. And what they do while they're being motivated by that, right? Then they write another short research paper. This is the one that's due in a couple weeks on one of the movements one of the women or the movements or organizations that they are most interested in. And then every, every day I do ask you to, as your takeaway to write about whether or not you're gonna use the materials from this class for in your final paper, okay? And so the final paper is about how can we contribute to creating a better, more sustainable global society, right? So that's what I mean. I don't mention it every time, but that's it. That's the question. Um, 
All right, so then there's just the standard stuff. I don't think I need to go through this. How, um, but what I wanted to go through was more information on the three papers. Um, I have the word counts. I have the citations, how I would like you to cite. Um, all right. And I am revising this outline a little bit at this point, but whatever is on the announcement is what really matters. Um, okay, so now I want to go to the paper rubric. So this is what I'll be looking for. Um, unless, I mean, I'm going to look at some other rubrics, but I, this is what it'll be unless um, some, somebody tells me otherwise. I think it's a standard rubric that you have to have a good thesis statement. So this is where, if you want to meet with me during office hours, that's, I, I prefer to have students meet because I like to talk to them about their papers and I like to help them make sure they get their thesis statement clear. Now, in um, when I live on campus at Lyon, I require students to come by my office, but it gets more complicated when it's online and in Bangladesh and all that. So I'm not gonna require it, but I would suggest it, I would recommend it. And you can come with another person. You don't have to just come alone, but we just hash out a thesis statement. I just ask you, you know, you come with an idea, you might come with an outline and we just talk about it. And I just, I keep asking you, do you want to say this? Would you like to add that? Um, how does this fit with that? I mean, I like doing that, <laughs> helping students get their ideas a little more focused. Um, so that's important. Do you have good arguments? Are you, are you referring to uh, resources, right? You have sources that are legitimate sources. So your premises might be quotes from something we read in this class or quotes from something in your research. They're based on facts or assumptions that everyone agrees to or authorities, right? And then the, the conclusions that you draw from those premises, do they follow logically? Did you state them clearly? Um, and then are all the parts of your argument, do all the parts fit together? And then do they collectively support the thesis? Um, you don't, let's see, you don't need six references. I'm sorry, I picked the wrong paper grade worksheet. You only need three, three, okay? Um, so forget the number six there. I'll try to change, I, I have another rubric, right, that has the number three, but everything else is the same. Um, all right, when you have a reference, you can't, don't quote too long so that the reader loses track of what your argument was. Don't quote too short, so I can't even tell how the quote supports your point. Um, explain the connection, explain how the quote supports your argument and incorporate it into the paper. It doesn't just stick out. It's actually flows, the argument flows. Um, examples, examples are good, they're great, but again, they can be too long or too short. So make sure they're long enough so that you show the reader that they support the point you're trying to support um, and you explain it um, clearly. And then it's not too short either so that I don't know how this example proves your point. You don't have too many examples. You don't have too few examples. Um, and okay, all right. 
Then you have the counter argument. You have to include somebody who disagrees with us. You think of the best possible disagreement and you are fair to it and you, you state it clearly and then you refute it. You explain why you think your view is better. All right, then we have the, the standard stuff about paragraphs. Each paragraph has to have its own topic. Uh, you explain the connection with the thesis. The parts of the paragraph fit into the paragraph, right? And then they're linked together logically. It makes sense. I can go from one paragraph to the next, and I know that it's logical. The grammar is important. I did ask a number of you to write your first draft, go to the writing center. Not all of you need to do this, but a number of you do. So, and the tutor will work with you. Well, the first thing you do is put it in a Google Doc, and if it has blue lines, correct it, right? That's easy. So students should not be handing things into me that a Google Doc would have corrected. So please do that first, unless there's some reason. Sometimes there's a student who can't get to the Google Doc uh, and can't get the blue lines. But then um, you try to, try to get an appointment with the writing center. Again, some of you might, for some reason, not be able to, that your electricity goes down or the time differences are, are bad and there's no time when, when you have electricity that the tutors are actually in the writing center. So that could be a problem. But in general, this is a writing seminar. If you can do the Google Docs blue lines, do the tutor at the writing center, and then I'll read it and I'll try to polish it and make suggestions. So this is, you know, this is it. This is how you learn to write. The other way you learn to write is just to read. And um, so reading things like I assign. So I try not to assign things with a lot of jargon because the way to learn to write is just read things like news, newspaper articles in English, because that's a kind of English that's just common sense, everybody can get it. You don't have to have strange vocabulary. A lot of academic writing has, has just a lot of jargon and it's, the arguments are complicated. And it's so hard for someone for whom it isn't their native language. It's even hard for a lot of native speakers because the, the arguments are so theoretical. So um, just keep working on your writing. And one way to do that is just to read news articles or um, maybe journal articles that aren't quite so jargon driven. Uh, then I grade on, so those are the basic requirements. So technically, if you did all of that, it would be a B minus, right? I mean, it would be a C, but I don't, I inflate grades, right? But then in order to get above the requirements, you there's some thesis statements are more complex. And that's why working with me on your thesis statement is a good idea because I can help you make it more complex and more complete, right? So maybe you want to argue a certain point, but when I talk to you, I point out that, well, if you want to argue that, you really need to include this. So sometimes you forget everything you need in order to prove your thesis. And it's creative. Um, I want each student to come up with their own ideas, not just repeat what a scholar says and not just you know get a stronger argument because this scholar says it and this scholar says it and this scholar says it. Um, you should, you can come up with something creative. You can come up with something like, but the scholars 
don't recognize, none of the scholarship recognizes that this is also an issue, right? That would be creative um, because you're adding your own mind and you're thinking of things that other people haven't thought about. So that's really good, right? And then uh, show how it explains some current event or trend. Why is your paper important? Why is your thesis paper uh, important? Show why um, uh, it, I mean, so philosophy papers often are trying to explain why. What are the underlying causes, foundations? What's actually going on under the surface? Um, so you're explaining why what you're describing in your thesis really does explain. It's a good lens through which to look at what's going around us, on around us, or it's a good lens for figuring out how to overcome a problem that we're facing. Then, um, these are things specifically related to Lyon, but I also think they're generally related to liberal arts education. So I think they also apply to AUW. And I do think it's interesting for you to understand that these two liberal arts schools on opposite sides of the world with opposite, with very different kinds of students who had, well, they aren't that different actually. <laughs> the students' backgrounds, a number of, of Lyon students come from more rural places and they come from more conservative places and they tend to be the kid that thinks outside the box uh, compared to where they came from. But anyway, so a liberally educated person has intellectual honesty, they're committed to truth. And so today I was trying to give you an idea of what that truth is that we're all committed to. They're fair to opposing views, they're patient with complexity and ambiguity, and you tolerate reasoned dissent, right? So your idea of the counter argument is the, the reason, the person who has good reasons to disagree with you. Um, and then our, everything I assign has something to do with human flourishing, right? Some idea of the highest good, and it can include some idea of God or the gods or karma or whatever, but it doesn't have to. Um, but whatever your background, you can, I don't, you know, those are words to me and you can um, just use them to explain your idea of, well, I mean, I definitely have Muslim students and they, they use their idea of what Muhammad, uh, what they think the prophet would like, would guide them toward in order to um, follow uh, Allah. Other people think of Jesus and Christianity. Other people think of just humanism. I have students at AUW and at Lyon that are raving atheists or just not raving atheists, <laughs> just atheists or agnostics. Or, I mean, I've had pagans and Wiccans and neo-pagans and I had a Satanist, I don't care, right? Just explain to me how you think human beings can flourish under this particular um, idea. Let's see, so that is the paper um, worksheet. Then I have, whoops, then I had an example of a student at AUW who wrote a research paper. And I think this is a good model. Again, I'm gonna check with Mr. Dr. Homer to make sure, but this is not the topic. It was a different class, but you do the background of the study, the background of your research paper. What is it? What is the situation that makes you want to write a research paper on this? The main claim, that's your thesis. Um, the significance, why it's important. 
um, the methodology, uh, your research method, which is that you're just going to read secondary sources, right? Um, so she talks about non-numerical data. That's any of the readings for my class are non-numerical, but some of your research might also be numerical. I'm not sure. Um, so how did she collect her data? She just explains which site she went on um, and what she looked for, what she looked under. Um, let's see, data analysis. I mean, <laughs> the research limitations, the literature review. I really think you don't have to do anything quite this complicated, but it is a good, um, it's a good model for you to get started because I think this is the model that the, you, you use in a lot of your higher level classes. That's the impression I get. So, um, I don't know how many of you have done papers like that before. I'm going to talk to Mr. Homer again about exactly what I, sh I should expect in a UG1 class, because most of you are UG1. So don't worry about that too much at the moment. Just think about what you want to write your paper on. Start looking for scholarly articles. Uh, come to the office hours if you want to. It's not a very long paper. It's only three sources, uh, three outside sources. You can use class sources in addition, but you need three new ones. Okay, Mahira. Yeah, ma'am, uh, can you suggest some topics of the research paper? Like what kind of topic, like gender equality, is it okay? Well, the thing is, it's always, what are you interested in, right? And so, I mean, do you want gender equality in relationship to um, education? Or do you want gender equality in relation to healthcare? Or do you want gender equality in relation, you know, to, you know, what? Does that make sense? Yeah, ma'am, uh, this kind of, can I write on this, uh, my research paper? Gender equality? Yeah, gender equality or in inequality. Well, sure, it's just that's way too generic, right? It'd have to be more specific. Um, but it's a starting point. I mean, I think every paper is going to be probably about gender equality in relation to something. So, yeah, <laughs> does that make sense? I mean, if you're, if you're writing about the United Nations Convention on Women, um, yeah, that's gonna involve gender equality, but your, you know, your focus is on the United Nations Convention on Women. Um, let's see. So ma'am, can you suggest some topics? Suggest some topics? Well, what I did was, what I said in the syllabus was, oh, you've already picked, you know, you've already discussed a number of organizations related to ecofeminism. You've discussed a number of uh, organizations related to women's education. And starting next week, we're gonna talk about women's rights organizations, um, any one of those, just pursuing those further to more depth is one way to go. Right, Mahira? Like, it's just what are you particularly interested in? But what classes do you like? Like if you like science, it would be gender equality in STEM uh, education or gender equality in 
jobs related to engineering because there's all sorts of evidence there's discrimination against women engineers, right? Um, do you see what I'm getting at, Mahira? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so just we can have a conversation about what subjects you like to study or uh, you can stay after class too. It's you sorting out what it is that's important to you. Like uh, I searched some organizations for women rights for this research paper and there is not enough information. Okay, well, you probably have to pick a different topic or a broader topic. So like what, what were you looking at? Like I was looking uh, like BRAC. BRAC? Yeah. I'm sure there's enough information. I mean, there's a lot of information on BRAC. What should I uh, specifically search about BRAC in Google Scholar or in Google? I think so. I mean, I again, you can contact uh, Dr. Naomi because she worked there for 10 years. So, I mean, I could contact her also if you want, but I mean, there's no problem. She would have yeah. a little if you give some uh, information about BRAC in the Google Classroom, links or something like that, it would be better for getting some information. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I just, I don't mind doing it because I, you know, I like getting more links, but I think most of my students are better at this than I am, but um, I can do it. I don't think it's hard, is it? Yeah, I searched some, but uh, everything, every article says same, same things. Oh, really? Well, I know I was doing some research when I was living there and there was, I printed out a whole pile of stuff. But anyway, okay, I have to let the other people go and I will, I'll check that out. Mahira, I'll check it out. Anybody else have any questions? I guess not.